In part two, we look at adding moving platforms, triggers, and character damage. Open up your scene from part one. If you're continuing on, you may notice there's some small changes. To organize the project better, I've moved the platforms and items into this level geometry game object and I've moved the movements of the character into a separate game object. If you want, you can load Basic Tutorial Part 1 Complete from the Platformer Pro package, which will give you the same scene as this. In this first section, we're going to add a moving platform. Let's switch to the scene view, and we'll add a child to the level geometry object. Rename this Special Platforms and Triggers. Select any of the existing platforms and duplicate it. And drag this newly created item into Special Platforms and Triggers. We're now going to add an up and down platform object or component to this script. Let's position this to the left. This script will move the platform up and down. We can set the offset for the top, which is the highest position the platform will reach, and similarly for the bottom, which defines the lowest position the platform will reach. We'll also give the platform a speed, which is the speed it will move at. Because we're moving this platform and it contains a box collider, let's add a rigid body 2D. But we're not moving it with physics, we're moving it directly. So let's tick is kinematic and change the gravity scale to zero. If we press play, we'll see that nothing happens. This is because we haven't yet told the platform to turn on. This is what these activation settings are for. So let's set activate on start, which means the platform will activate as soon as the scene is started. While we're here, we might change the sprite, just so our moving platform looks different to the other platforms. Let's hit play. We'll see we now have a moving platform and our character can stand on that platform. Let's select our platform object and try some of the other activation settings. Let's set activate on stand and an automatic deactivation, deactivate on leave. This will mean the platform will start moving only when the character stands on it and will stop moving when the character leaves the platform. Let's have a look. And when we leave the platform, it stops. Now let's take a look at using a trigger to turn the platform on and off. Select the platform and turn the automatic activation and deactivation to none. We're going to delete this coin object. We're going to create a new empty game object to act as our trigger. We'll call this moving platform trigger. And while we're here, let's rename this platform to moving platform. Now we'll take the moving platform trigger and move it across to where the coin was. We're going to add a component called the proximity trigger. This triggers whenever the character is in range. There are other types of triggers, such as a unity trigger, which uses the standard unity triggers, or a one-way trigger, which only triggers when the character moves a certain direction. For the proximity trigger, we can set a radius, which will be displayed in the scene view. When the character's transform is inside this radius, the trigger will activate. 
let's set a receiver for this trigger by dragging the moving platform to this receiver placeholder. We'll see that a line is drawn across to the platform. Now we need to select what happens when the, the trigger is entered. We're going to activate the platform. We're not going to do anything when we leave the trigger. Let's see what that looks like. When we enter the trigger, the platform is activated. Let's add a sprite to show the state of the platform. We'll create an empty child under the trigger and we'll call this switch sprite. Let's add a sprite renderer component. And pick a button sprite. Now what we want to do is listen for a change in this trigger and do something to the sprite so that we can see it's activated. So we're going to add an event responder and it's going to respond to the trigger events. When the trigger is entered, we're going to switch the sprite. We're going to use the sprite render attached to this sprite and the new sprite will be this green depressed button. Let's take a look. We'll see that the sprite changes in response to the trigger enter event. Let's select our trigger again and add a leave action of deactivate platform. This means we'll turn the platform off when we leave the trigger. We also want to add a new event responder. This will respond to the trigger exit event or leave trigger event by switching the sprite back to the red button. We'll drag the trigger to the sender component and we select the trigger exited event. This time we'll still switch the sprite, drag the sprite render across but we'll use the original red button sprite. Let's take a look. You'll see that the button changes and the platform is turned on and off as we enter and leave the trigger. It's not very playable to have the platform switch off as soon as we leave that trigger. So instead, let's try an auto leave time. What this does is sends the leave trigger action after a delay. The trigger action is no longer tied to our presence, but purely to a timer. So let's put a value of five in the auto leave time. We press play and see what happens. We'll see that the trigger no longer turns off when we leave it, but if we wait five seconds, the trigger will turn off, updating the sprite and stopping the platform. This allows us time to get to it. Let's now look at adding the ability for the character to take damage. Firstly, let's create some geometry to represent the damage causing objects. Again, let's start by duplicating some of these platforms and we'll move them down. Duplicate again, move them across. And we can use the snap settings to lock them in place. Let's duplicate again and change these to spikes. Now, in order to create spikes, we need to place them in a layer, firstly, that collides with the character. If you're using the default layers, there'll be a layer called Enemy Hazard, which is perfect for this. We also need to add a hazard component 
to these spikes and enter amount of damage that these spikes do. Let's say they do one damage. We have some other settings, such as whether these spikes also damage enemies, whether it's a one-shot, meaning they only cause damage once, and also a damage type, which allows you to have different damage types. For example, we could set these to be physical. We'll leave it at the default of none. So these objects will now cause damage, but we need to add the ability to the character to take damage. We do this using the character health component. This has a number of settings. We'll start by setting a starting health of 6 and a max health of 6. And we'll give the character one life. When the character's damaged, they'll become invulnerable for a period of time. Let's say one second. We can also set things that happen when the character dies. We're going to add one death action. And that action will simply be to reload this scene. This scene. We don't want to reload straight away because we probably want to see the response to the damage. So let's add a delay. In other words, when the character dies, the scene will be reloaded after a one second delay. There are a number of other settings. We won't be looking at them at the moment. There's a couple more things we need to do. Let's find our character's collect box. Currently it has a character reference. We're going to change this script to be a character hurt box. This means the object will now allow the character to take damage. Finally, we need a movement to respond to damage. So let's add a damage movement component. Like other movement components, we can select what happens. Let's choose an animation with bobble. This will set an animation state and then bobble the character, bobble height into the air. So in this case, we'll use a bobble height of 0.5. Let's take a look at this in action. Before we do, let's rename these objects to spike so that we distinguish them from platforms. Everything's ready to go, let's hit play and see what happens. As we fall onto the spikes, we take damage, and after 6 damage, we'll die, and the scene will be reloaded. Let's see that again. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Let's add some UI components so that we can see our character's health. We'll switch to the game view and we'll create an empty chart of our canvas. Let's align this to the right top. Call it character health. We'll add a UI health icons object to this. This shows sprites to represent character health. So let's set some sprites ordered from low to high to show the character's health. We've got two sprites. We're going to use heart half full and heart full. We also need to add images for each of the health icons. Let's set the heart image so we can see what it looks like for positioning. And let's make the size around 24 in both X and Y. We're going to need three of these because our character has six health and we have two states, full and half full. Let's rearrange these.
We're now ready to test our UI. One thing we might want to do is rearrange the order there. And you may have noticed that the half looked like it was coming from the wrong side. So let's flip the scale. Now when we press play, our health bar is all but complete. As a final touch, let's add an empty sprite, which will be shown when there's no heart filling up the bar, but will let us know what our max health is. And there we have it. That's all for part two. In part three, we'll look at enemies, power-ups, and the camera system. Stay tuned.